you can clap. <laughs> yes, you can clap. Clap for me. <laughs> All right, so to start us off, we have three virtual talks, and our first talk is on kernel GPA, a deformable slam back end, uh, being presented by Fang Bai. Hi everyone, it's a great pleasure to meet all of you guys here, and also it's a great pleasure to attend this year's uh, Robotic Science and Systems Conference. Uh, my name is Fang Bai, today I present Kernel GPL, a uh, deformed Muslim banking. Here is a typical slam problem. Here we have odometry and landmark measurements. Now imagine we don't have odometry, is the resulting problem solvable? Without odometry, this problem is called Generalized Request Design Analysis, or GPM. In particular, landmark-based LAM without odometry is called rigid GPM. From rigid GPM, we can solve both poses and landmarks. Having said that rigid GPM is sufficient to determine poses and landmarks, what if the environment is deforming, where each point cloud has different shapes due to the existence of deformations? To accommodate deformations, we must use more general transformation models in GPM, for example, the affine transformation. An even more general form is the linear basis warp, or LBW. In general, a LBW contains a, a fine part and a nonlinear part, and all the parameters are linear and constraint-free. The nonlinear part of the LBW admits a dual formulation, thus we can obtain a kernel-based transformation model. The kernel-based model is more flexible than LBWS and avoids the complication of choosing nonlinear basis functions. For deformable transformations, we need to design transformation constraints, otherwise the solution will be trivially zero. To proceed, we introduce a concept called shape coherence matrix. In specific, the shape coherence matrix is only related to the rotation, and on the rigid transformations, the eigenvalues of the shape coherence matrix are preserved. Here are the transformation constraints we use, where lambda contains the unknown eigenvalues of the shape coherence matrix. The first constraint fixes the translation and restricts the shape coherence matrix to MM transpose. The second constraint fixes rotation because it forces the shape coherence matrix to be of the diagonal form. We also use regularizations to control the extent of allowed deformations. By putting things together, we have the overall formulation for GPA with deformable transformations. This problem can be solved globally up to unknown lambda and we can design lambda afterwards with additional assumptions. To solve this problem, we first reduce the above to an optimization problem of M only. And then applying variable replacement, we see the reduced problem is a spatial eigenvalue problem. This eigenvalue problem has a closed for solution if the O1 vector is an eigenvector of Q, which is true for LBWAs and kernel-based models, as we can prove Q times 1 equals to 0. Following the discussion of RJCV, this is due to the existence of a free translation in the transformation model. Now we have solved the problem up to an unknown lambda. The next step is to design the lambda with additional assumptions. Here we assume the transformation to be as rigid as possible. We use pairwise proquestis in RJCV by assuming some points are globally visible in all point clouds. This is a strong assumption for SLAM as observations in SLAM are typically local. Instead, in this ISS, we propose to solve a unified optimization, which is a standard nonlinear least squares that can be solved by Gauss-Newton iterations. We give a robust and cheap initialization to this problem. On the left is the initialization process. We first eliminate translations and calculate a affine relaxation to the rotations. Then we use the orthogonality constraints afterwards to obtain a linear least squares in lambda. This gives a clue for initialization to lambda. We use Gaussian kernel for experiments and design the kernel bandwidth and regularization strength by cross-validations. We show the error statistics of different transformation models, Euclidean of fine TPS and kernel GPA. In particular, kernel GPA gives the best performance. We compare the new lambda estimation method with the one in RJCV. For dataset with a lot of missing correspondences, the proposed new lambda estimation method is better. We check the poses solved from the unified optimization. 
These pool's estimates are basically the same as the ones obtained from rigid GPM. Lastly, we propose TOPX, a city point cloud dataset with correspondences. The correspondences are partitioned into several categories. We use one category to estimate the transformation and the others to validate the performance. Consistently, kernel GPA gives the basic results. On the right, we provide some qualitative examples. That's all. Thank you for listening to the talk and see you next time. Goodbye. All right. Hello, everyone. Okay, uh, our next talk is CURL, Continuous Ultra Compact Representation for LiDAR, presented by Kai Cheng uh, Zhang. Use a pipeline that can compress and enhance the density of the LiDAR point cloud at the same time. A traditional 64 channel LiDAR generates about one terabyte of data per day. So for autonomous driving, having all data recorded is hard. What's more, when the robot working in the indoor scenario, we would expect the 3D map could be as precise as possible to satisfy all different tasks. Even a bedroom point cloud map like this, that could reach about 4.2 gigabytes which could be hard for mobile robots to load in real-time applications, and it consumes lots of RAM memory for more infrequent usage. Most LiDAR point cloud contains lots of holes. Therefore, how to enhance the density and reconstructing the surface from the existing sparse point cloud is also a problem. For point cloud compression, recent works depend on the tree structure, which is hard to represent on no regions and enhance density. There are some works that can do upsampling, but none of them can do compression at the same time. So, how to achieve both abilities? Therefore, we introduce spherical harmonics functions which are also normal and complete, which means all 3D polar functions can be decomposed into a series combination of spherical harmonics functions. This is similar to Fourier series regression, but the latter point cloud usually contains some sparse regions. By using the same degree for encoding, we can see from reconstruction that higher density could provide better prediction results. The LiDAR point clouds usually contain a large number of points, so computation costs could be huge by applying spherical harmonics functions directly to it. So we designed the curl pipeline to solve these problems, which mainly contain three parts, meshing, upsampling, and encoding. To solve the sparse problem, we proposed a meshing method for upsampling. We first project points onto a 2D plane, then apply the knowledge triangulation. Finally, we can get a watertight mesh by projecting back connectivities. The next steps are upsampling and denoising. After upsampling from mesh directly, there are lots of superior points. To remove these points, we use the depth image of the original point cloud to generate two kinds of binary masks. The first one is a point grade representing the occupancy pixel of the depth image. The second mask are for click detection, removing wrong sampled points between sharp gaps in three different directions. We first increase the resolution of the point grids to match up sampled point cloud. Then we project this back to click detection masks to correct the point grid mask. Finally, we apply this mask to the noisy point cloud to clean. The next step is extracting spherical harmonic coefficients. To reduce computation costs, we divide the entire upsample depth image into many patches. But how to get suitable degree? For existing points, a higher degree can provide better reconstruction results. However, overheat could occur if the degree is too high for unknown regions. So we select diagonal pixels as testing cells and the rest of them are training cells. To cover the gaps between neighbor patches, we extend the training cells. Then we iteratively increase the degree to find the lowest error for both training and testing cells. With coefficients and masks, we can do a continuous reconstruction now. Here is the result of matching up sampling. We have fewer errors compared with the LiDAR super resolution method. This is one scan of a 64 channel LiDAR point cloud in the university. The ratio of, of 1 to 1 reconstruction error is at the level of millimeters, which is lower than the error level of the LiDAR sensor itself. For continuous reconstruction, 
Crow can produce more than 10 times of points than before and only takes 11.9% storage space of the original. The green map is after integrating the denser point count. Our result takes less storage space but with comparable points number with the ground truth. Here is another map example in the indoor scenario. We can increase the point number to about 30 times more than before, and the size is only about 18% of its original. In summary, we have two main contributions. One is the 3D LiDAR point cloud representation pipeline. The second contribution is an efficient matching method and upsampling technique to solve the sparsity problem. For more information, please find our paper and code. Thanks for watching. Our next paper is SEER, Unsupervised and Sample Efficient Environment Specialization of Image Descriptions, being presented by Stefan Schubert. Hello, my name is Per Neubert and together with Stefan Schubert, I work on specializing descriptors for a particular environment in the context of visual place recognition. I will first shortly introduce the underlying problem and idea and then present SEER, our algorithmic approach. The basic task is to associate a query image like the one on the left from the Karl Marx monument in Chemnitz with a set of images of known places in a database. An important tool are general place recognition descriptors like NetFlat or HDZ Delph that indicate the similarity between images of places. I call them general because they work for a broad range of environments. For example, the typically used NetFlat model was trained on urban images from the city of Pittsburgh, but in a way that it can be applied to images of other cities as well, like Chemnitz. However, this NetFlat model does not work well for an open natural environment, like in the Norland dataset. But we can assume that NetFlat trained on natural images more similar to Norland would create a better place recognition model for this environment. And thinking even further in this direction, what if we train NetFlat directly on the Norland database images? Or more generally, what if we train any descriptor directly on the database images? The hope is that the descriptor is then optimized for this particular environment. An important observation is that in place recognition we always have a database that we can use for training or fine-tuning. However, there are some challenges that might prevent a straightforward training of a descriptor like NetFlat. The database might be small, for example just a few hundred, hundred images. Very importantly, we do not have labels. There is no ground truth information about which database images show the same place. And finally, in downstream tasks like loop closure detection for online SLAM, we might not have a lot of time or computing resources for training. And of course, this descriptor will be environment specific and not be applicable to other environments anymore. This leads to the following problem statement of this work. Is it possible to adapt, improve or fine tune general base recognition descriptors for a particular environment, for example the city of Oxford, in a completely unsupervised fashion and with low sample and runtime complexity? We propose a simple unsupervised greedy learning algorithm to approach this problem. SEER stands for Sparse Exemplar Ensemble Representations. The first step is a simple greedy learning on the database in order to create an internal representation or model M. The input are general place recognition descriptors like NetFlat or HTZ Delph. SEER starts with an empty set M and adds for the first incoming database descriptor an ensemble of K sparse exemplars. An exemplar is simply a sparsified version of the input descriptor, using a weighted sampling to select about 5% of the input dimensions with a large absolute value. For each further descriptor, we test whether there are already K similar exemplars in M that can be reused and newly create the missing number of exemplars as before. The purpose of the second step is to apply the exemplar ensembles to database and also to query descriptors in order to produce the SEER output descriptors. Each incoming descriptor is compared to each exemplar and the resulting environment specific descriptor is simply the sparse vector of similarities to the most similar exemplars. The output descriptors can then be used for image retrieval and place recognition in the same way as general place recognition descriptors. We implemented and extensively evaluated the simple algorithm. There are six main insights from the experimental evaluation. The place recognition performance improves over the raw general descriptors. We evaluated this on 23 sequence comparisons from six environments. We can see that the mean average precision of SEER applied to NetFlat is considerably higher than the general NetFlat descriptor. Moreover, we can combine SEER also with other descriptors, for example HybridNet or HTZ Delve, and in all cases there is a considerable performance improvement. For the best descriptor, HTZ Delve, 
We also demonstrate that Seer is considerably better than other approaches for the script adaptation from the literature. It is also much faster than the follow-up approach. The representation is indeed environment specific. It does not work to create the exemplars on Norland and then create the descriptors in a different environment like Oxford. We show in an extensive ablation study that each of the components like sparsity and ensembles are necessary for the performance. We show that Seer is computationally efficient. In particular, for repeated operation in the same environment, the growth of the representation M significantly slows down and more and more exemplars are reused. We also show that the overall number of operations is only about twice as large as for the comparison of the initial descriptors. Also, the parameter selection is non-critical. We use the same set of parameters for all experiments. And finally, SEER can be used in batch and online scenarios. In particular, it is not necessary to have the complete data database available. We can simultaneously extend the database and create the output descriptors, for example for loop closure detection in an online SLAM scenario. Code is available. Please do not hesitate to contact us in case of any question or ideas. We are particularly interested in applying the SEER approach also to other recognition and retrieval tasks. All right, we're now switching over to in-person speakers. Uh, the next talk is Sub 1.5 Time Optimal Multi-Robot Path Planning on Grids in Polynomial Time. Uh, and the speaker is Chen Guo. Yeah, hi, everyone. My name is Chen Guo. I am a PhD student from Rutgers University. Today, I will be presenting our joint work uh, with my advisor, Professor Jing Jing Yu. We focus on multi robot path planning on graphs. Given the graph G, a set of robots with start configuration XR and go configuration XG, we are tasked to find paths for routing the robots from XR to XG. Multiple robots can move along the graph edges simultaneously, but collisions must be avoided. This means that two types of moves are forbidden. Two robots cannot exchange locations using the same edge, and two robots cannot occupy the same vertex at the same time. Usually, the solution quality is measured by some objectives. Here, we focus on minimizing the max band, which is the time it takes to complete the reconfiguration. In this work, the underlying graph is an M1 by M2 grid, where the robot density is ranging from 22% to 100% which is very high. MRPP finds many real-world applications, including video game, transportation, swarm robotics, and especially warehouse automation. Here are some of the warehouse-related applications where the underlying environment is grid-like. Amazon, Orkado, Jingdong, and other express companies have deployed thousands of robots for fulfilling orders and sorting parcels. These robots essentially run on a grid lock setting. To summarize the result, assuming random XR and XG, we prove that in low polynomial time and with high probability, we can compute 7 to 10.5 asymptotically optimal solutions at 100 robot density and we can compute 1 to 1.5 asymptotically max band optimal solutions at up to half robot density or 2 ninths robot density with regular obstacles. Our algorithms can scale to over 50,000 robots with sub 1.5 max band optimality. In contrast, MRPP on grids is strongly NP hard even without obstacles. Previous based polynomial time big O1 optimal algorithms have very large constant factors. On the other hand, non-polynomial time step optimal algorithms do not scale very well to large and dense instances. Given the limited time, I will highlight how we achieve the sub 1.5 optimality for one third robot density. To get the optimality guarantee, we first establish a max band upper bound of M1 plus 2M2 in our algorithms which I will explain a, bit, a little bit more in detail on the next slide. Also, we establish a lower bound for, of M1 plus M2 for the same setting, and we, when we compare these two bounds, we can get an optimality ratio of 1 plus M2 divided by M1 plus M2. When M1 and M2 are similar, the ratio is, is about 1.5, 
If M1 is much larger than M2, the ratio is 1. Overall, we achieve 1 to 1.5 asymptotic optimality with high probability in low polynomial time. On the next slide, I will, ex I will explain how we achieve the upper bound. To go from XR to XG, we first apply unlabeled MRPP algorithms to both of XR and XG so that each 3x3 three three cell has exactly three robots in it. And then, to achieve the low configuration of the augmented start and go configurations, we apply a novel Lubic table algorithm, uh, which says that any configuration of the M1, M2 atoms in the M1 by M2 table can be realized using M2 plus 2M1 row or column shuffles, where each shuffle can arbitrarily reconfigure as a single row or a column of the table. Using the Lubic table algorithm, we can get a set of row or column shuffles which can move the robots between the desired configurations. And then we apply a hardware heuristic for realizing the row or column shuffles, which is possible at one third robot density. Overall, the maximum is M1 plus 2M2. We implemented all the algorithms. Here on the right, we are showing some of the animations of the computed plan. Note that our algorithm can scale to tens of thousands of robots while the, robot, while the optimality ratio is still about 1.35. And thank you very much. All right, very good. Uh, so, all right, I think we have one question in the audience. Uh, thanks for the great talks. Uh, I have a question for the kernel GPA uh, paper. So um, I think I probably missed it in the presentation, but what type of regularization uh, did you guys use? And uh, have you guys tested other kind of regularization? Thanks. Yes, so for, for the other series, so basically we use the TPS. So in that case, we use the bedding energy matrix. And for the ISS, so basically we use the undated matrix. So it's possible to do the other general matrix, but we didn't do that. OK, thank you. Question on this side. Yeah, I have a question for the last paper, the past planning one. So are you, are you assuming all the robots are the same, or can you deal with different kind of robots with different kind of capability, like speed and others? So in our work, we assume all the robots are the same. They have the same size, they have the same speed. Okay. So how about the case when like, a, a robot like, uh, fail and then the, the path and everything changes? Can you deal with this, this case? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? So for example, in the middle, one robot failed and then blocked the path. Are you able to like, replan very quickly, or what, what, what's your strategy on this? Uh, so, so in this work, we, we solve the one short multi robot path planning, and we don't replan the path. Okay, thank okay. uh, All right, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I have another question for the Crow paper. Uh, so, can you elaborate a bit more on how you go from the uh, projected 2D? Uh, LiDAR points to the mesh. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, when uh, the, the 30 point out, uh, we project them onto the 2D based on the topological relationship for each race shooting, uh, shooting, shooting uh, in the 3D environment. And uh, when, when the ray is uh, when each ray is near with its neighbors, they, uh, they we, put, we assume that they could be near in the 3D environment. So we, when we do the 2D projection, uh, uh, it, can, uh, it can recover the topological relationship with uh, rays. Uh, I think we also open source the code. It could be more uh, more easy to understand. 
Mark. Thank you. Thanks. I think we have a question on this side and then. Question for Curl as well. Um, I'm wondering, since in most, I guess, point cloud applications, the point clouds will, in a grid cell, will usually lie on some very thin manifold. Um, but the spherical harmonics seem like they would be better at representing volumes. So I'm curious if uh, wh why the, the spherical harmonics are good for representing these thin surfaces. Uh, in the beginning, I explored some papers uh, from computer graphics. So I found out they, uh, they use this representation to uh, reconstruct models. So I start to think about how, whether can we use this to represent 3D line of uh, Usually they use it in a uh, small, small scale model. So, uh, so we want to make gen, uh, we want to make it to work in a larger scenario. Uh, so I think uh, I'm not sure whether I answer your question or not. Yeah, I was mostly wondering about like uh, I, I, when I think about spherical harmonics, it's usually representing volumes, mm -hmm. um, like a closed volume. Whereas here in the point yes. cloud case, it's a lot of like very thin surfaces. Um, yes. So I was wondering how you make that work. Are you taking a level surface of the um, uh, spherical harmonics? Or? No, I, I don't think uh, it's usually used in a uh, in a polar function, 3D polar function, like a star shape, there is no overlap in one direction uh, if shooting from the origin of the coordinate. So it's just uh, directly used for the support component function. Okay. I, I think we, yeah, we'll do these last two questions. Um, hello, uh, I have a question for Colonel uh, GPA. Um, so I'm wondering, um, I, I see the evaluation is mostly um, done on one object-centric trajectory. I, I'm wondering, so if the environment map est estimation is generalized well for like multi-object multi uh, centric uh, trajectory and uh, the like general, general trajectory, like general uh, uh, large-scale search from ocean scene. Okay, yeah, let's answer the good question. So the currently, so we can only deal with uh, continuous environment. So basically, we assume the, the map to be kind of uh, represented by one model. So basically, if you have uh, several multiple objects, like deforming objects in the environment, and like kind of severity, so basically we need to, yeah, take another approach. So currently, so this is basically because of the deformation, the, the deformation model cannot have, have multiple objects. So basically, yeah. That part needs a, a bit more work. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Um, thanks. Uh, for that. So, how about uh, like a general static things? The, the the estimation map can 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 be generalized well, right? Um, sorry, so by means so so what's I didn't get the point. So. Um, yeah. Sorry. Maybe I can follow up in the post session. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Last question. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, so I have a question for the crow. So uh, the first question is that how robust is the uh, algorithm? Because I saw that you need a denoising uh, process before you uh, convert it into the uh, final representation. So I'm wondering if the input before that stage is very noisy, uh, what will happen to this representation? Uh, it's for this method, it all depends on the. I believe the line of point out is the actual representation of the, our environment. So, uh, the only request is, uh, if the point out could be, if the point out could be denser, the result could be better. If it's too noisy, I think it's just the representation of the real world. So it should be fine. Uh, but uh, when we do have something there, we, we can we did uh, sample some noisy points, and uh, uh, we, we we can denoise very well uh, to remove the wrong points we sampled from the mesh. 
I see. Okay, thank you. My second question is that uh, for uh, for the second stage of your paper, uh, you are doing a two D polarization stage to do the meshing. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering. So I think the two D polarization works because uh, you are uh, the, the input is a two D scanning lidar. So basically, you can do the projection onto the two D plane. What if yes. there are like uh, points? Uh, there will be multiple points on the on the same ray, so that the two D polarization won't do the meshing. If that's the case, uh, uh, can can you still process this, the the three D point cloud without any assumption? Uh, I think that's a car, that's a limitation of our current method. If there is overlap on the or occlusion on the same ray, uh, it's it's uh, we can solve solve that problem yet. It cannot build a very good mesh because we would do the sampling from the mesh we use recasting. So yes. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Let's thank our speakers one last time. All right, and we'll move on to our second round of short talks. The next talk is uh, Occupancy Slam, Simultaneously Optimizing Robot Poses and Continuous Occupancy Map, being presented by uh, Shodong Huang. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Shodong Huang. This is a joint work with uh, Liang Zhao and Ying Yi Wang. We are all from the Robotics Institute at the University of Technology, Sydney in Australia. So our work is called Occupancy Slam, and uh, it means simultaneous optimizing the poses and the occupancy grid map. Occupancy grid map is commonly used to describe the obstacles and free space in the environment. When the robot poses are known, we can uh, use the observations to build up the occupancy grid map. And the evidence grid map is a popular method because uh, it's simple to update the grid. The evidence is actually additive, so you, you can simply add the new evidence to the previous one. In 2D laser-based SLAM, traditional methods use the two-step approach. The first step is to optimize the poses. The second step is to use the poses to build the map. So we ask the question, whether this 2D, a two-step approach is the best or not. So in this work, we propose a one-step approach, which is simultaneously optimizing the poses and the grid map. One of the challenges here is there's no clear data association because the map is a grid map. So we propose to use the continuous occupancy map because using a single value to describe the uh, evidence of grid is not accurate enough. Here we use the uh, occupancy value at the corners to calculate the occupancy value inside the cell for any, any uh, position using bilinear interpolation. So in this case, only the values at the corners are our variables. So the state vector including all the robot poses and all the occupancy values at the corners. And the uh, observation information, uh, we sample the laser beams and get uh, the observations uh, along the each beams. To build the objective function, uh, we first transfer the observation to the map coordinate frame and then compute the difference between the actual observation and the expected observation calculated from the map. Uh, because the evidence value is additive, we need to divide the map by the number of hits in this case. So this is our observation term. For the whole object function, we also add another term called odometry term and another term called smoothing term. The smoothing term here is mainly used to uh, improve the convergence of our algorithm. So you can see from our algorithm, uh, one key step is we, keep, we change the weight on the smoothing term. So after some iterations, we will reduce the weight. 
Uh, this is a result using the museum data set, and we can see our occupancy slam can get a better result than a cartographer. And this video shows more results using other data, different data sets, and it also shows the convergence process of using this uh, Intel data sets. So you can see the weights here is changing uh, after some iterations. Finally, we, uh, the algorithm converts to a good map. So in summary, occupancy slam is the first to optimize the poses and the occupant grid map simultaneously, and it uh, outperforms existing method. Uh, the uncertainty of the map can also be obtained from our algorithm. Uh, currently, we are uh, still keep improving the algorithm to get uh, better robustness and uh, computational efficiency. Uh, this is a wonderful result we have. We start from very low resolution map, and uh, after some iterations, we convert to some reasonable result, then we switch to a high resolution map. In this way, the computation complexity can be reduced significantly. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, you're welcome to draw my poster to have any further discussion. Our next paper is a uh, conflict-based Steiner search for multi-agent combinatorial pathfinding being pre presented by Richard Wren. Hello, everyone. I'm Richard Wren, a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon, and very excited to share our work, conflict-based Steiner search for multi-agent combinatorial pathfinding. So we have seen multi-agent system emerging in many applications. An important question is to tell these robots where they should go. And very often, these robots need to collectively visit a large number of target locations for the purpose of information gathering or pick and place items. With that in mind, we formulate the following graph search problem called multi-agent combinatorial pathfinding. So the goal is to plan collision-free paths from the start to the goals while visiting intermediate targets. In addition, we also consider assignment constraints. That is, a target must be visited by at least one of the eligible agents or say capable agents. And we want to minimize the sum of individual path costs in the graph. So there are mainly two related areas. So the first one is multi-agent pathfinding. So multi-agent pathfinding resolves conflict between agents, but very often they ignore the uh, optimal target sequencing requirement. On the other hand, multiple traveling salesman problem can allocate and sequence the target, but they typically do not consider collision avoidance constraints between the robot. And the goal of this work is to bring these two areas in a principled way together so that we can compute solutions with quality guarantees. So our approach consists of three key parts. So first, a joint target sequence specifies the allocation and the visiting order of targets for each of the robot. Given a joint target sequence, we can leverage the existing conflict-based search to plan collision-free path for all the robot. Specifically, if two agents occupy the same node at the same time, then there is a conflict, and we add constraints to forbid either of the robot from using that node at that time to resolve the conflict. Now, how do we obtain those uh, joint target sequences? We solve a k-best sequencing problem. The goal is to compute the k cheapest target sequences. And formally, this problem is referred to as k-best multi-depot, multi-terminal Hamiltonian path problem. Currently, in the literature, there is no algorithm to solve this k-best multi-agent sequencing problem. So we propose our approach to solve this problem. So first, we leverage a transformation technique that can transform the multi-agent problem into a single-agent counterpart, which is basically a traveling salesman problem. Then we leverage the existing technique to solve the k-best traveling salesman problem. Put them together, now we can solve the original k-best multi-agent sequencing problem. And by increasing k to k plus 1, we can compute the next best target sequence when we need during the search. OK, now the remaining question is, when do we need to generate the next best target sequence? And the answer is, when the cost of the current conflict-based search exceeds a certain threshold. 
And this threshold is controlled by a hyperparameter, epsilon, that can take a value ranging from zero to infinity. And correspondingly, our algorithm can output solutions that is guaranteed to be optimal, bounded suboptimal, or unbounded suboptimal. Okay, next I'm going to give you an intuitive understanding about how we provide solution quality guarantees. So basically, the entire search process proceeds along two directions, either resolve conflict between the agents or generate the next best target sequence. Along either direction, the search cost is guaranteed to be monotonically non-decreasing. And in addition, the entire search is organized in a best first search manner so that the first conflict-free solution path returned is guaranteed to be optimal. Okay, and here I want to share with you a gazebo ROS simulation in a warehouse-like scenario. Uh, I model the workspace with occupancy grid, uh, four connected graph, and as you can see, the plant path can direct the robot to visit the target, uh, let the robot take detours to avoid each other, and get them coordinated in dense coupled areas. Okay, and the short message is that our planner can handle up to 20 agents with uh, up to 50 targets with solution quality guarantees. More numerical results can be found in our paper, and our code is also available online. Okay, that's the end of my talk. I'm happy to answer any question you have. Thank you. Thank you. Our next talk is the Traversing Supervisor Problem and Approximately Optimal Approach to Multi-Robot Assistance being presented by Tian Chen Ji. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Tian Chen Ji from Human Centered Autonomy Lab at UIUC, and I'm very glad to be here to present our work on Traversing Supervisor Problem, an Approximately Optimal Approach to Multi-Robot Assistance. Roboticists have made noteworthy progress on developing trustworthy robot autonomy. However, robots in the real world are still not perfect and may fail out in the field due to harsh and uncertain environments, especially for low-cost robots, as shown in these two videos. To make it worse, the robot may not be able to recover or resume the task by itself, and the physical assistance from a human is required to continue the robot task. Um, in such cases of imperfect autonomy, a human-in-the-loop design is necessary, where a single human may need to supervise and manage multiple robots. However, optimally identifying which robot to assist in which order is a challenging task for human supervisors. To share the burden with the supervisor, decision support systems have been proposed to provide advice on which robot to assist in which order. Many previous methods approached the assistance problem using an MDP, whose optimal solution is intractable due to the complexity. In contrast, we model the human uh, multi-robot assistance problem as a graph traversal problem, based on which the optimal path can be computed for the supervisor to follow. Um, in details, we assume that the robots are spatially, distribu uh, spatially distributed over a field of interest to complete some navigation tasks. And the goal of the supervisor is to uh, rescue any robots uh, that fail so that the overall human-robot team performance can be maximized. If there are no robots to assist, the supervisor can rest in the control center, which is denoted by the house um, in this figure. Now, in order to plan a path for the supervisor, such as the red lines in this figure, we model the human-robot team as a complete directed graph, uh, where, uh, whose nodes are the robots, the supervisor, and the control center. Most importantly, we define the node reward of a robot as the expected distance that the robot can travel if visited, minus the distance if ignored by the supervisor. As a result, the note reward will be zero if the robot is operating normally, and will be a positive number if the robot fails. The edge cost is defined as the time required to travel between the two nodes on the graph, which is different from the constant cost in many previous works where the robot's teleoperation is available. Note that um, the positions of the robots and the supervisor are time varying, thus um, this problem is a dynamic problem where all the variables depend on time. 
Furthermore, we define the value function of a path pi as the difference between the total discounted reward collected along the path and the total discounted traveling cost of the path. Our goal now is to find a path for the supervisor that can return the highest value by solving the following dynamic graph traversal problem. However, this problem is intractable because it requires extra information, such as the knowledge of future robot trajectories. To overcome this issue, we approximate the solution to the original dynamic problem by solving a static problem, where the node rewards and edge costs are fixed to their initial values and the discount factor is removed. Such a static graph traversal problem can then be cast as a profitable tour problem, which can be solved efficiently in real time. Um, under certain assumptions, we also uh, developed a bound on the approximation error, uh, which is a function of the system parameters, such as the number of robots and the field size. We demonstrate um, the effectiveness of the proposed uh, planning algorithm in the simulation environment of an autonomous farm. To examine the performance of our method under different conditions, we conduct experiments with varying levels of robot autonomy and robot fleet sizes. Uh, we compared our method against multiple baselines and shows that um, the PTP can achieve the fastest task completion time among the five methods under all levels of autonomy and all robot fleet sizes. This figure shows the percentage of the field covered over time with different approaches. We notice that although our method sh uh, achieves less progress at the beginning of the task compared to the greedy approaches, it does generate superior global performance due to the long-term planning. And this concludes my presentation. Thanks for your attention. All right, our last talk of this session is cooperative multi-agent uh, trajectory generation with modular Bayesian optimization being presented by Gilhun Ryu. Uh, good morning, I'm Gilhun Ryu, and our work is about generating a co cooperative multi-agent trajectory for quarter of vehicle. Yeah, and the cooperative system, vehicles are traversing a complex environment to accomplish the task while avoiding the collision with other vehicles. To find the time optimal trajectory, we focus on two properties of this problem. First, the vehicle can pass through the same position at different times, so the trajectory may intersect. Also, the vehicle only needs to attain this formation constraint at certain position, and they can deviate from the formation to traverse more efficiently. And so to formulate our problem, we utilize the same minimization method. Uh, this method used a, a smooth piecewise polynomial, which is obtained by minimizing the fourth order derivative of pro, a trajectory. It consists of outer loop optimization, which determines the time allocation for collision free uh, polytops, and inner loop optimization that converts this time allocation to actual polynomial trajectory. So, our strategy is to first find the time allocation that satisfies our cooperative planning constraint and convert it into the polynomial with that inner loop optimization. So we first decompose the free space into complex polytops and find the time allocation of each vehicle on each polytops. And these are our cooperative planning constraint, which consists of formation timing constraint and individual dynamic visibility and vehicle-wise collision avoidance constraints of trajectory that is obtained from this time allocation. Uh, because of the complicated quadrilateral dynamics and noisy sensor data, the last two uh, constraints are uncertain and hard to model explicitly. So we utilize a Bayesian optimization to find the optimal solution under this uncertain constraint. Uh, Bayesian optimization select the next evaluation point with the acquisition function and update the surrogate model based on the evaluation result. Uh, we propose a uh, modular structure for surrogate model, and each module approximate the individual dynamic visibility and vehicle-wise collision avoidance. We use a binary Gaussian process cl classifier for each module. 
And we, to further improve the sampling efficiency, we propose a cascade random sampling. So we first uh, generate a candidate solution for two vehicles, and sequentially add the solution for the next vehicle that satisfies the formation timing constraint. And among this uh, candidate solution we generated, we select the next evaluation point based on this acquisition function. Our acquisition function consists of two parts. The exploitation part selects a solution that is faster than current best solution with sufficient probability to satisfy the feasibility constraint. Uh, if the algorithm cannot find such solution, it uses the exploration part, which selects a solution on the feasibility boundary that has the largest uncertainty. We applied our algorithm to ideal photodynamics model and simulated environment that include control delay and noisy sensor model. For the simulated environment, we used the multi-fidelity Gaussian process to further improve the sampling efficiency by combining the low fidelity evaluation. So we first applied our algorithm to the ideal quadrodynamics model and generate the tra fastest trajectory that has a feasible control command. And we compare our method with two baseline methods which use the formation control and mixed integer programming. Since we use less conservative collision avoidance constraint, our method can generate faster trajectory than the baseline method. And we also apply the same algorithm on the simulated environment and generate the time optimal trajectory that has a certain level of tracking accuracy. Okay. Um, finally, we test the optimized algorithm in the real world environment, and we are able to fly the four drone up to seven meters per second with the centimeter distance with other drones. Okay. Thank you for listening. Uh, feel free to find me during the poster session. Thank you. All right, we'll invite all our, invite all our speakers back up for questions. All right, we have a question on this side. Hi, um, I have a question for the multi-objective kind of robot fixing paper. Uh, thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, are there any scenarios where the path that's generated for the human to follow are perhaps optimal for efficiently fixing the robots but are perhaps not the best like for the person to follow, so maybe like zigzag patterns or just something less like, comfortable, I guess. Can you hear actually a repeat of a question that I can't hear clearly? Oh, can you hear me? Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so are there any scenarios where the path generated is perhaps really efficient for uh, the robot kind of planning oh. problem, but not as convenient for the person, so maybe like zigzag patterns or something like that? Oh yeah, so uh, I think uh, if, so our one of our assumptions is uh, if the robot can uh, make the path, then the human can also like uh, traverse that path. Um, so yeah, like they can share the same path, um, that's our uh, assumption there. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I have a question for the occupancy slam paper. Uh, so uh, I'm wondering the choice of the um, bilinear interpolation. Uh, have you guys tested uh, like some other interpolation methods such as um, I think bicubic uh, spline interpolation? And uh, uh, if not, is the choice of bilinear interpolation like for optimization convergence rate or uh, something else? Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure whether I understand your question. The first thing is about the bilinear Interpolation, right? Yes, yeah, so I'm just uh, wondering, uh, like, have you guys tested uh, like other interpolation methods, such as uh, bicubic? Yeah, for this one, uh, we just choose this uh, bilinear one, which is uh, relatively simple. Uh, but uh, definitely, we, there, there can be other interpolation can be used, but we haven't tried yet. So, what's the second question? Uh, the, the second one is just uh, like uh, whether um, I'm just asking whether uh, the use of bilinear interpolation is for like convergence rate, but you already answered that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay. okay. All right. 
I had a question for, uh, for, for Richard, uh, the paper on conflict-based Steiner search, which was, uh, so what happens if you have some humans or some uncontrolled agents in the environment? You can either think of them as if some of the robots are adversarial or there's a human there. Um, could you extend your method to handle that? Are you robust to that? And what would you do in that case? Okay, thanks. Great question. So currently in this work, we do not consider like uncertainty in the environment or adversarial robots. Uh, but I think that's a very interesting uh, area. Like, uh, as far as I know, like in multi-agent pathfinding, there are work that consider uncertainty. Uh, and uh, for traveling salesmen, I believe there are also work. Then, uh, if that's the case, then I believe within the same framework, with some effort, uh, these two different type of approach should be able to, uh, you know, uh, fuse together to address the new challenge here. All right. Uh, I'm guessing probably people don't want to ask any more questions because it's now between us and the coffee break. So I encourage you to find all of our speakers uh, and come talk to them at the poster sessions uh, and we can uh, go get some coffee.